Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you again. So welcome to the second lecture on electronic commerce. We had our first lecture on Tuesday, and that was pretty much an introduction to the course. And also, we went through an introduction to basic principles of business, so where we could see different uh, terminologies that are used in business. Before I start today, I would like to apologize for a couple of things. First of all, we had some technical problems with the projector. It went off a couple of times, and I spoke to the technical guys. They said the projector got some issues. They, are, they have ordered a new one for this room, so in the meantime, we will have to live with it. So probably it might, ha it might happen again today. And second, there was also uh, some technical problems where the video that was recorded on Tuesday disappeared in some way. So we hope today everything will be fine, except for the projector that we just have to wait for the new one. So maybe in some lectures to come, it will be OK. So on Tuesday, we introduced the course. And also, I thought it, it was uh, a good idea to introduce some of the basic terminologies that are commonly used in business and business strategy. Because if you look at your book, there are a lot of terms that I'm not quite sure that all of you have the necessary background to understand. So I thought I could go very quickly on some of the basic terminologies that are, we will be using so often so that you can have a kind of uh, picture of what you're expected to. So today we will introduce the core of the course, and that is uh, electronic business and electronic commerce. But before I do that, I would like to do a quick recap on what we did la on Tuesday. Does everybody has a device that can allow him or her to access the internet? That could be a smartphone, a tablet, PC, a phablet. The phablet is the smartphone with a bigger screen. Uh, do you all, everybody can have access to, in, to the internet? Almost? So, uh, we will have an online quiz. And how this it works is when I start the quiz, I want all of you to. Go to this site. Cloud.it. Is everybody there? Have you been asked to provide a, a pin for the game? Yeah. Yep. So this is the pin of the game, 76542. And once you are in, your name or your nickname will appear on the screen. Nineteen players, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, 
26, 27, 28, 28. Probably that's it. So this is how, oh, 29. <laughs> 30. Yeah, so this is how it works. Questions will appear and you will have options, three options. And what happens is on your device, those uh, symbols for those options will appear on your screen. And you choose the symbol for the correct answer. Is that OK? Here we go. So that's question number one. Cherry is a professional DJ. Which of the following is most likely to be our supplier? And the faster you are, the more points you earn. You have 30 seconds to, to finish that. So if she's a professional DJ, one of the possible organization or individual, an enterprise that would act as a supplier for her would be a record store. So we move on to the next question. And remember, the rule is the faster you are, the more points you earn. So at the top, we have NAS. And we move to the next question. When does the business add value? When revenue is greater than production cost, when revenue equals production cost, when revenue is less than production cost. Are you ready for the next question? Nas is still leading. Next, how do you reduce the risk of starting a new business? Next, who are stakeholders of a business? Next, in the long run, what is that all private sector firms must aim to do? Make a difference, make products, make a profit.
which of these are, are the two main types of competitive advantage? The last question. And the winner is Nas, who is Nas, probably deserves a round of applause <laughs> and a little gift from me. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Of course, this will not happen in every quiz. This, be <laughs> this is just because it was the first one. The idea was, was just uh, to have a kind of quick recap because I thought maybe it's kind of boring to ask the questions and go around. So I will be using this quiz from time to time as a way of revising some of the concepts that we have learned in the previous lectures. So today we are introducing the core of the business and that is e-business and e-commerce. Before we go to that. I would like to ask you, does anyone know what happened in, 19, uh, in 18th century? A huge phenomenon that brought a turn around the human history. Anyone has a clue to that? That's the Industrial Revolution. With the discovery of the steam engine, there was a huge transition from the traditional ways of produ production to the manufacturing, like new methods of, uh, of producing. And this brought a huge change to the, to the human history. It affected almost every aspect of uh, mankind. So during Industrial Revolution, there was a tremendous uh, change in how people started to produce, how we started to live, uh, how we started to accumulate uh, capital. And this was a big, uh, had an, a huge impact uh, in the history of uh, mankind. And here is 20th century. Just like the case with the Industrial Revolution, in the 20th century, something big happened again. And this is the Digital Revolution. It, it happened somewhere between 1950s and 1970s. And what happened in this, uh, peri uh, du during this period was the adoption and proliferation of the computing technology. So that's when we started using uh, computers. And in many ways, the computers have changed the way we do things today. The digital te uh, technology, which came about as a result of digital revolution, marked what we call the information age. That is, the period in the human uh, history where the traditional industries that were created by industrial revolution are now replaced by the digital technologies. So in this era, things are, d are done based on the computer computerization of the information. So there is a rapid proliferation of uh, computers, and this has affected, just like the case with industrial revolution, it has affected almost every aspect of our lives, whether it's uh, in education, whether it's in entertainment, whether it's in healthcare, whatever you can think of, we have been, it has been much affected by the digital revolution. But at the center of the digital revolution is the internet. 
And what is internet is, this is the network of computers across the globe. So the computers brought a lot of fundamental changes. But the real part started when the computers started to talk to one another. And when I say computers started to talk to one another, I mean is when the computers were interlinked to one another in, in such a way that the users could communicate in real time between and uh, through the computers. But this is not the end of the story. As an icing on the cake that is on the internet, the real change happened when the World Wide Web was discovered in 1991. So it was from this time, most organizations changed the way they did their thing. In combination of the internet, uh, the World Wide Web, and the wireless communication technologies, things b began to change tremendously. And what I, we mean by World Wide Web, this is a technique for publishing information on the internet. So before 1991, very few people, and in, in fact, very few organizations had an access to the internet. Mostly it was government institutions or big companies. Internet was not available to the rest of us. But uh, after 1991, when the first World Wide Web was published, everybody got access to the internet. And that's when the organization began to take advantage of, uh, of the internet. Now, this transformation, like the internet, the World Wide Web, uh, the wireless communication is regarded as a form of disruptive technology. And what it means by dis disruptive technology, these are the technologies that replace the traditional or the old technologies that people are used to, that companies are used to. And uh, as D uh, Daniel uh, defined in 2004, he said disruptive technology is a technology that changes the basis of competition by changing the performance metrics along which firms compete. So what disruptive technologies do is to create a new base of competition because companies now adapt new ways of doing things. And if when people do activities, as we saw in Tuesday, that in order to create a value, you need to do some kind of activities. Now, the difference between successful companies and failure companies, one could be on the resources they have, but also it could be on the way they are doing their things. Now, technology, in particular, this, uh, this uh, digital technology has changed the way companies are doing things. And because of that, they are regarded as disruptive technology. Here are some of the examples. Do some of you recognize uh, that device on the left-hand side? A typewriter. Any one of you use a typewriter? Two, three. Yeah, we just have to wait for a moment and it will start again. Here we go. So during its time, a typewriter was regarded as a powerful device. And probably, if you ask people at that time if there could be anything that could replace a typewriter, maybe they would say no. But as we will see, come on. Yes, there we go. So here disruption happened. Computers came in. And today, a typewriter is a history. 
We don't even, some people don't even know it, as we have seen it now. Very few of us have used it. It's probably in the museum. It's no longer in use. In the past, we used to write letters. Of course, it may be a very few people still do it, but we, we can't imagine that. But an email came in. Any one of you still writing letters to their friends, or you still write? Oh, that's cool. We're <laughs> but generally, we don't do that anymore. Landline -line telephone. During his time, this was a, a big news. But then a cell phone came on. Of course, today we are not talking about this type of telephone, but at least when it just came, it was a big story. Over time, this has also changed from cell phones, that's the first uh, cell phone, and that's the guy that uh, discovered it. And today we have smartphones. We no longer use that. So what, what, what is a d disruptive technology? The guy that invent, uh, coined this term, Clayton M. Christensen, he's a professor at Harvard uh, Business School, he get, provided two features of a uh, disruptive technology. First, in the beginning, these technologies are not very attractive. When they just came in the market, they are not that attractive, either to businesses or even to the users. And we'll see an example in a couple of minutes. But second, over time, they improved tremendously to replace the traditional technologies. So here's an example, a film camera and a digital camera. Does anyone that has ever used this one, a film camera? Cool, but today we, don't, we no longer use that. No, now, we have, we have like, when you travel, you have the, the one-time use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the film camera. Yeah. yeah. But this is what happened in 1975 when the digital camera just came in. The weight was 3.63 kg, and that, that's how it looked like. 0 0.01 megapixel, just black and white. The first photograph took 23 seconds to create. To play back images, data was read from the tape and then displayed on a television set. Would anyone like to have such a thing in 1975? No. Why, uh, why are you bringing 3 kg? And this is the quality of the pictures in 1975. This is uh, what a film camera produced in 1975, and this is what a digital camera could give you in 1975. No one would like to have this, because that uh, picture has a better quality than this one. Is it it? However, as Christensen says, over time, disruptive technologies improve tremendously. So this is the difference between, between a film camera and a digital camera in 1975. This is the performance of a digital camera, way below the curve, below the graph. And this is what a film camera produced. You can see a huge difference in performance. But over time, the digital camera kept on increasing its performance. And this is what consumers wanted from a camera from 19, in 1975. Uh, but over time, digital camera kept on being able to produce or to provide what consumers wanted. So the thing is, when we talk about digital uh, uh, di uh, disruptive digital technologies or disruptive technologies in general. We say that in the beginning, the di disruptive technologies are not that attractive, but over time, they improve. So what it, it does is, as a business person or as a person that you are going to work with a uh, business, you need to keep your eyes open because technology is dynamic. Things are changing over time, and if you want to stay competitive, in the marketplace, you have to observe the changes every day over time. Because if you dwell on the old technologies, your competitors will very soon catch up on you and you will be thrown out of the market. So the main lesson from this is that 
as a person that you are going to work with digital uh, business, digital enterprise, because that's what the game requires today. You need to keep on watching the changes that happen in the marketing space, especially with regard to the technologies. And that's why we are here to learn about electronic business and electronic commerce. Now, to distinguish these two terms, I will begin by explaining what uh, electronic commerce is and later on we'll have a very smooth transition to explaining the notion of electronic business. So usually a lot of people use the two words interchangeably as if they were the same. But basically what electronic commerce is the performance of transactions over electronic networks and mostly we are talking about the internet. And this, what this involves is the transaction between an organization or an, a business enterprise with 30-part uh, part actors, such as consumers or suppliers. And you can look at it in four different perspectives. The first perspective is the, as a communication uh, uh, mechanism where e-commerce is regarded as a means of delivery of information goods or services with the third parties. But also you can look at e-commerce uh, e as a business process, per, in a business process perspective, which means we look at it as a way of automating the different business processes within a, an organization that facilitate interaction with third party actors. A third perspective could be a service perspective where we look at e-commerce as a way of speeding up services and cutting down costs. On Tuesday, we talked about the importance of reducing costs as a means of uh, building capacity to be a cost leader or making difference. But you can look at e-commerce e as a way of cost reduction by speeding up services and improving general quality of the service. And the last perspective is an online perspective, and that simply we look at e-commerce as a way of buying and selling online. Now, if you combine all these uh, four perspectives, you will realize that e-commerce is not just about buying and selling online, but also it includes the associated activities. For instance, pre-sale activities or after-sale activities. Before you sell a product, sometimes consumers would like to get some information. For instance, when we are searching for information uh, or in a search engine like Google. That's a part of e-commerce. You can look at it uh, in that way. But also, after buying products, we may require extra information for the products that we have uh, uh, acquired, whether it could be usage information or you would like to fix uh, a product that is broken. For instance, companies like uh, uh, Apple, they have an online community where you can continuously acquire information about the specific product that you have uh, purchased from them. So all these kind of activities uh, constitute e-commerce. But it's important to distinguish between two types of e-commerce. And that is because, as we'll see in the second part of the course, when you are creating a strategy for e-commerce, you need to be very specific as to which side of the e-commerce you are working on. So we have two main sides, and that is the buy side of uh, e-commerce and the e uh, sell side of e-commerce. As the two uh, terms suggest, the buy side is, involves the interaction between an organization and its suppliers. Uh, I will demonstrate it uh, pretty soon. While the sell side involves the interaction between the organization and its customers. So assume this is your, your firm. I call it a, a focal firm. And this is the direction of your value chain. What buy side e-commerce means is the interaction that your firm has with its suppliers. That is the enterprises or individuals that are providing inputs to your firm. So if you are doing this in transactions online through electronic networks, 
That's what we call the buy side e-commerce. But also you could have interaction between your firm and the individuals or other organizations that are buying products from you. If these transactions are carried over the electronic networks, that's what we call sell side e-commerce. Now, for those of you who have little background on uh, supply chain management, usually a firm would be interlinked to a lot of other firms. If you trace a product, you could find a lot of uh, firms that are involved. So these are firms that are immediately uh, in, in interact with the focal firm. And these firms also could also have suppliers. And you could trace it backward and to a point where you, you can find the original point, maybe the source of raw materials. And likewise, on the sales side, you have firms that have immediate interaction with the firms. This could be, say, wholesalers or agents, whoever that is uh, buying products from the Oferco firm and pass it on to other actors all the way to the end consumers. So if these transactions are done over electronic networks, that's what we call e-commerce and can be distinguished either as buy side e-commerce or sell side e-commerce. Yes, here we go again. Now this brings us to another interesting point because we are talking about performing transactions of electronic networks. And these electronic networks could be linking an organization either to the buy side or to the sell side. Now the internet is the main network where most of these transactions are taking place. But you, as we said earlier, the internet is open to everybody that has access to it. When you have your business, there are kind of information that you wouldn't like an intended audience to have access to. So there are different levels uh, of uh, access that you would like to permit over the internet. When the access to applications that have sensitive information in your organization is only limited to employees of your organization, that's what we call intranet. So when the network is only accessed by people within the organization and other people outside the organization cannot access it, that's what we call an intranet. But sometimes you may want to extend part of your intranet to some other people outside your organization. For instance, let me show you. For example, th this is my account on Amazon. With this account, I get some extra privilege compared to a person that doesn't have an, an account with Amazon. They keep my information. They are suggesting books and other products that they think uh, I might uh, like. So in, in a way, I, I get some extra access to Amazon servers. But still, I am not an employee of uh, Amazon. Therefore, there are 
some kind of information that I cannot access. But at least it gives me some privilege compared to a person that doesn't have a, an account with them. So this is an example of extranet arrangement, whereby part of your intranet is extended to some outsiders that are not part of your organization. But all of these are created based on the internet standards and could be accessed through the World Wide Web technology. So there are different types of cell site e-commerce. We have five of them, and I will describe one after another and give some examples. So the first one is transactional e-commerce website. So with this website, the intention or the main purpose is to facilitate purchase and sale of products online. So the goal is to provide in information to consumers that want to purchase your products, or even those who are planning to purchase products offline. But they could get some information that eventually will result into uh, purchase or sale of products. And example of this type of website include retail size, travel size, online banking services. So Amazon is one of the uh, examples of that, but also other online retailers, such as Zalando and many other you can think of. This, uh, they provide an, an example of transactional e-commerce site. Another type of e-commerce uh, website is services-oriented relationship bu building website. So typically, this type of websites are not intended for sale of products because in most cases the products that are, are, are provided by these companies are not very suitable for purchasing online. So what the company does is to maintain a website where they, the aim is to stimulate purchase and build a relationship with customers. So for instance, Audi at the at the corporate level, where is Audi? Huh? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, for instance, on this website, you, you cannot purchase a product. This is the uh, Audi, the main site. They are providing you with information like new models that have come into the market, the, the new technologies that they have developed. And in case you, you would like to purchase or you are interested in checking into details or where you can buy those uh, products, they direct you to individual countries' websites. So for instance, we are in Europe and this is Norway. So you can move from the, the main website to the specific country website, right? So from this side, it's possible to buy products or different services. But at the main website, the idea is just to stimulate purchase or to create relationships. But when you go to the country-specific website, that's where you, you can buy services or uh, products. So for instance, you can order, if you have Audi model, then you can order service from here. So if I had a Audi, probably we could go beyond this point, but that's all we can reach. But th this is just an, uh, an example to illustrate what a service-oriented relationship building website is. And then we have brand building sites. These are sites that the intention is to provide an online experience to support the brand. The products are not available for sale, just like in the uh, relationship building website. The idea is just to support the brand, and usually when you build your business, 
and you want to build your brand, there are two things that you have to take care of. One is brand awareness, and the second is brand image. So you want your brand to be known by your consumers, that when people think about buying products, they should consider your brand first. So you do kind of activities that will raise awareness of your products. And this is what most of the leading brands are doing. If you think of uh, Rema, Tucson, um, Bunpris, and many other brands, they are working on this to raise awareness, to make sure that when people think about products, that it, uh, product category that they are offering, their brand should come to their mind to their minds first. And then you want to work on your image. That is, what kind of associations people attach to your brand. And here, there are three things that you have to take care of. You want to build associations that are positive. unique and strong. So when people think about your brand, they should have positive feelings about it. They should have unique feelings about it. And those feelings have to be strong. Now this kind of websites can help you with raising awareness as well as building the image of your brand. So let's look at Nike. So just like, as we saw with Audi, in this website, you, you, you cannot buy products. This is the Nike main website. Well, so here we go again. So the objective of Bradley building a website is to create a, an online experience. So when you, you visit this kind of website, they would provide you with some kind of interactive content that could be text, uh, videos, or pictures, just to stimulate and get a kind of feel of what the brand is about. And you can also get information about uh, the new products that they are launching, but also they can help you with extra information. For instance, they have a section for frequently asked questions. If you want to contact uh, Nike, here you can find a store. So you cannot buy products from this website, but they can give you a lead of where you can buy the products. 
then and then the fourth type is publisher or media website so these are the type of websites where they publish information news or entertainment about a different kind of uh, topics and the information could be either on the website or sometimes they could just provide a link uh, to other websites and how they make money usually is could be through advertising or commission based sales and sale of customer data as we will see it uh, uh, in the second uh, topic and that is business models so examples of such websites is fin.no tv2 cnn and a lot of books they have the could be categorized uh, in this uh, type of website so i can show you for instance we can have uh, this is tv2 uh, facebook page and normally as i said because most of them are making money through advertisements their main goal is to attract traffic they want to get as many people as possible to their websites so for instance tv2 is using facebook to attract traffic what they do is they are posting intriguing stories on, on their facebook page but you cannot read that story like you, know, you, you don't get access to the whole story you have to go to their site but this is what happens when you go to their site usually they would have a, an ad and if it's a video it could be an interesting video that they posted on facebook before you watch that video you will have to watch an ad and it's even different from youtube where sometimes you can skip an ad with them you have to watch the the ad until you finish before you can watch the video that you're interested in now the challenge is to keep the traffic come to your website but also for instance to to make people wait for those ads because sometimes it's uh, it's really boring to to watch uh, an ad that you don't like but what you do is to make sure that you're posting in interesting content something that you would make everybody come to your site and some even wait for the video to come so whether they watch the video or not but they are making money because to them i, I think the the model could also be the per click for every video that people watch they get paid for that we will look at all these th different revenue uh, models and as i can see so already one probably it's time to have a break and we will continue the session in the next 45 minutes after the break